Welcome back to The Glenn Alex Show. I'm your host, Glenn Alex. And each episode of The Glenn Alex Show focuses on a different aspect of health because I believe in total health. And um, this ex- this episode is, is pretty exciting because it is a replay of me being interviewed by my writing coach, best-selling author, Patrick Snow. We cover my book, Living in Total Health. We talk about the different elements involved in total health, the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And we also discuss my mission, which is to help as many people as I can be joyful, connected, confident, and complete. The life experience I call wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H, which is health plus other riches. So I wish that for you and for every other human on this planet so we can make this world a better place for all of us. So please stay tuned and check out the interview. Welcome, everybody. This is Patrick Snow, host of the Patrick and Mary Unstoppable Author Interview Series, where we interview inspiring authors around the world to help us all live a better life, achieving more time, more money, more freedom, more health, more love, more happiness in life. Today, we have a fantastic guest, formerly from Las Vegas, but now living in Oregon. Her name is Glenn Alex. She's the author of the book Living in Total Health. And uh, you better get your shoes strapped on, your seatbelt buckled <laughs> up. And uh, if any of you are interested in boosting your health and wellness, you've come to the right place. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to read you her bio as we kick this off. If you want to follow along online, you can do so at glenalex.com. Again, glenalex.com. Again, her book is Living in Total Health connecting with your wealth. So Glenn's, uh, Glenn Alex life work is about health with careers in social work, writing, charity, therapeutic massage, and she's an amazing tennis player and coach. Her transformative system and mission is to help others to be joyful, connected, confident, and complete. The life experience she calls wealth, which is health, plus other riches. So we're going to have her define that more in a little bit. Glenn's journey in health space began with boundaries. As a child, she was so engaged by the nuances of interaction. When people smiled, cringed, and the pain crossed their faces, Glenn clearly remembers vowing not to be the one to cause another person pain unnecessarily. She saw boundaries, respected and boundaries, um, and stuck with it. From that point forward, Glenn's work expanded to other areas of health, and she developed a unique and no-nonsense perspective to help others lead their healthiest and most joyful life. Professionally, Glenn's experience is a well-rounded in health and wellness. She is author of the award-winning book, Living in Total Health, and Health Blogs, a licensed clinical social worker, a licensed massage therapist, a United States uh, PTA a professional tennis association, certified tennis coach, a burn along instructor, wisdom app top mentor, founder and executive director of former Glenn Alex Foundation and host of the Glenn Alex podcast now in its sixth year. Some of her other professional achievements include the 2021 Independent Book Award winner in health and wellness as a finalist in Mind, Body and Spirit for Living in Total Health a 2023 Book Excellence Award finalist in health for living in total health, a 2022 USTA Intermountain Award winner for diversity inclusion, interviewed many big names on her podcast, 
and uh, uh, she has done online courses for overwhelmed women, helping them continuing education for social workers and massage therapists, charity work, and un in underinsured and underserved individual. She's also been in the publication Journal of Community Practice and Development of the Violence Innovation Program for Women. When not working in one of her many careers, Glenn enjoys playing tennis, working out, watching movies, learning pickleball, and connecting with her loved ones. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Glenn Allen. <laughs> Thank you so much. I so love reading everybody's bio because I want people to know the full story of who our guests are, and uh, I want them to be impressed with all of your achievements. So welcome to our show. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Patrick. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to do this. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, and you know what? I know you were in Las Vegas before. Now you moved to uh, uh, Oregon recently. Yeah. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out how we originally met. Was it somebody else in Las Vegas connected us about five, six, seven years ago? How long? Yes. Was yes. You you were in Las Vegas doing a, a publisher's workshop. Um, Lori Chaffin invited me to it, and um, we connected from there. I remember Lori. I don't know where she's at now. She's still in Vegas, maybe. I, no, I thought she was in Hawaii. Hmm. I heard at one point she moved to South America too. I don't know. Central oh, okay. America. Anyway, <laughs> a wonderful person. So you've written this incredible book and um, your subtitle is Connecting with Your Wealth. W-E-L-L-T-H. So that's not the normal version that we see. So tell us what wealth is defined as the way you spell it. W E L L like well, and then T-H. Describe that. Okay. Well, wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H, is a play on the word wealth as in money. Unfortunately, most people, too many people uh, assume that money, um, those kinds of riches are um, the key to health and happiness. It's not in and of itself. Money provides access to other things and opportunities Yet wealth for me, W-E-L-L-T-H, is health first, plus other riches in life, such as financial comfort, such as uh, authentic loving relationships, such as healthy boundaries, such as um, uh, making the best choices available to you. So wealth for me is health first, plus other riches, and mostly the intangible things in life that we tend to underestimate things like friendships like yes. love like yes. businesses like yes. freedom like independence yes. yes so all these things that uh nourish our lives that's what you'd say is your definition of wealth yes Absolutely. okay so your book title living in total health what is total health all about and what are some of the things that prevent us from living in total health uh, I think that some of the thing, the main thing that keeps us from living in total health is narrow mindedness. We define um, health as being thin and fit. And so we only focus on diet and exercise. Well, health is way more, way more. And living in total health addresses all 12 aspects of total health. So when we only focus on diet and exercise, we are limiting our potential. And we are putting ourselves in a, in a box and health is just so much more. And as I mentioned before, the, it's the intangibles that actually enrich life. So you're talking about like spirituality and emotional well-being and yes. peace of mind, these kind yes. of things. Yes. The physical is important, yet it's not the only aspect of health. Yeah. Wow. Well, and I've seen it time and time again, you look at people in great health and all of a sudden they start having anxiety attacks and panic attacks and you look at them and they look like they're physically fit, but emotionally they're a wreck. Yes. So I love that. Well, let's take us back to your youth. How did you come up to grow up and have this fascination with uh, health, wellness, uh, boundaries, all of these things? So take us back and tell us a little bit about your youth and kind of what gave you this entrepreneurial spirit as a young, as a young lady. Okay, well, I am the youngest of 10, and uh, we were very social people. We always had guests over, 
or going to house parties or whatever. And where and was so, this? Where, where did you grow up? In LA. In, in LA. LA. So being and, the youngest of 10, you probably had a lot of confidence because you got to watch <laughs> nine older siblings kind of screw up here and there. <laughs> Although I did learn from my older siblings, I, I honestly did not have a lot of confidence um, because I was the pipsqueak. I was the smallest and the youngest. So there was a lot of pressure on me to live up to certain expectations and certain standards. So as we were having these parties and social events, I would just be enthralled by interactions. I could tell when people were being kind to each other, when they were being hurtful, just from facial expressions and body language. And that spoke to me. And that's when I decided I would not intentionally harm another person. Obviously, I will defend myself to the best of my ability, but I won't be the aggressor. And it, it just blossomed from there. In order to have healthy boundaries, you need support, you need um, healthy relationships, you need an understanding of who you are and what is best for you. So my path to health just evolved from watching those interpersonal dynamics into other areas of health. And I've, I've been a health seeker and health researcher all my life. So talk about um, what are some unhealthy, you know, things that people do that mess up their spiritual health, their emotional health, their physical health. What are some major unhealthy habits, characteristics that we need to look out for? Maybe the sugar addiction or maybe, you know, being too lazy or being a couch potato. What are some of those unhealthy, you know, habits that so many of us have that we have to watch out for that they don't take over our lives? Uh, the bottom line for me is excesses, excess in consuming too much junk food, too much alcohol, too much cannabis, um, being clingy, needing too much attention, um, not, uh, the, the main thing is just not trusting self, not listening to self, and because our intuition, which we're born with, it's innate, and that comes from our creator, we don't listen to it. We externalize our power to other people and things and hope things fall into place for us, assign our power to other people to make us happy. Those things lead to unhealthy choices and those unhealthy choices lead to unhealthy results. So I would say, number one, look out for the excesses. We all have vices. We all have our pleasures in life. It's the excess going too far you've heard the term moderation is key. And so that's what I'm speaking about. More than that, it, it's about uh, not taking yourself seriously enough to trust who you are and what your needs are and waiting for someone else to make you happy. Mm. So it's okay to have a chocolate chip cookie every now and then, just don't eat the whole container. The you know? whole container or eat it every day. Yeah, <laughs> not every day, just a, a weekend kind of thing. Yeah, maybe. So let's say one of your clients comes to you and they're an emotional wreck, um, they're a physical wreck, they're uh, anxiety, panic attacks, they're overweight, they're out of shape. What's some of the best health advice that you give to people right from the get go? Because there's got to be reasons why people overeat, over drink. Um, how do you work with them to kind of get to that bottom line to find out what it is that they're doing? And then what's the best advice or best program you kind of put them on to help them regain control of their health and wellness? Well, the first step would be to uh, manage the symptoms. It's really difficult, if not impossible, to uh, get to the root cause of an issue if you're having panic attacks or if you're so depressed, you don't get out of bed and shower. So it's addressing those symptoms that inhibit you to function fully first. And there are things that I will suggest, um, meditation, yoga, any kind of physical movement, uh, journaling, and, um, and managing those symptoms. Once you get those symptoms um, under control to a degree, then you can do the deeper mental work and figure out what the belief systems are what the unhealthy thinking patterns are that lead to those unhealthy choices and negative outcomes. So I will start with the symptom management and then work on what is inhibiting this person from being fully who they are 
in, given their lifestyle, their situation, their circumstances. So in other words, I heard a quote or I read a quote the other day on social media that says, you don't determine your destiny. You don't create your own future. You basically choose your habits and then your habits determine your future. In essence, that's what you're saying, correct? It, it's close. It's close. But you can create other habits, better, healthier habits that will create your future and lead to your destiny. Wow. So the habits work both ways. They're positive and negative habits. So I'm mm. leaning more towards developing a, a system of being, a way of being that leads to these positive, fruitful outcomes. So maybe replace some of the unhealthy habits with healthier habits. And then as a result of that, your unhealthy thinking and belief system will change and you'll be on your way to living in total health. So let's go back to your early adulthood years. You were in social work. You've done all of these things. Talk about some of the uh, work experience that you've had that have kind of put you on this path, that have given you compassion and empathy for other people, setting boundaries. Um, I mean, I'm fascinated. Anybody that's involved in social work, I just, my heart goes out to them because <laughs> that's a very challenging, you know, career. So talk about what equipped you to be this author, this speaker, this health expert, because I'm fascinated by, you know, your, your, your background. Well, I've, I've always been in, been interested in helping other people be their best. And that's always been what I strive for. Every day, um, I, I try to be the best I can. And that means that I must be present in my daily existence. I must be aware of what I'm saying, what I'm doing at any given moment, so I can self-adjust if necessary quickly. And so while I've always been interested in helping others do the same, I've always been interested in teaching and, and just sharing my out-of-the-box thinking. And social work became an, um, a path. I, I initially wanted to teach in public school, and I said, no, nah, that's too dangerous. I don't want to do that. And then social work presented itself. And, and because it is a people-oriented um, industry, then I it, it just... It just drew me in and social work is available in all different areas there's the welfare social worker there's the um, advocate social worker and then there's the mental health social worker and that's what i um, move towards because i firmly believe that healthy individuals will create a healthy collective when we on an individual basis are not living our best lives or living in total health, then we elect people to lead us who are less than healthy. And so my focus has always been on the individual to create a better collective. Well, and if there's any uh, truth to that, which there obviously is these last three or four years, as all this corruption <laughs> in the world is exposed, we need uh, better leaders. That is for certainly the case. Yes. Um, what do you find most gratifying about your work uh, and why? Oh my gosh, the most gratifying thing, and this happened just the other day um, with a client, is as we're talking about her high anxiety and um, her feeling uh, like a failure because she's not where she thinks she should have been in life at this point. And so as we were having a conversation, I said something and she just lit up and she goes, oh, that makes sense. And so that to me is very gratifying when someone's, when the client is listening to themselves and their intuition and they get it and they get it and then they understand and they can make better choices and have better outcomes. Mm, I love it. I love it. So then based on this process, you've done social work for all of these years. What gave you the idea and what led you to writing your book, Living in Total Health? What was that inspiration? Um, Okay. <laughs> I have three friends who have known me for a very long time who've always said, you should write a book, you should write a book. It wasn't until uh, 2014, I was starting to come out of a really deep depression. It was the deepest depression um, of my life. And it still gets to me when I think about it today, because um, my brother had passed um, in July of 2013 from prostate cancer and he was super young. So I didn't get it. I fell into a deep depression. And as I started coming out of that, I met you. That's mm. when you had the workshop. It was, I believe in April of, 
um, 2014. And so after I went to your workshop. Um, was that had, the one that was out in West Las Vegas, like West of town by 10 miles? No, I think it was closer to the strip. Okay. I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it was closer to the strip. Um, so after we met and we talked, um, I, I said to myself, well, you, you should write a book. And my depressive mind said, why? Why bother? And then my intuition kicked in and said, why not? Mm. I listened to my intuition and here we are. So what was the process like writing for you? It had to be cathartic. It had to you know, <laughs> solve that depression. It had to give you energy. Um, so many of my clients that write and publish a book, they say, you know, it's not about the process of writing a book. It's about the confidence that I get. And it's about who I become as a result. So what was that process like for you? Well, you've been looking at my notes, Patrick, because I actually wrote the word cathartic. The writing process was absolutely cathartic for me and not only helping to work through that depression that I was experiencing, but it also helped me work through and resolve some unresolved issues that I had from my uh, first marriage, from you know uh, difficulties with friends or work issues. So it helped me work through a lot. And, and I have to say that being firmly grounded in my boundaries also helped through the process and it firmed up for me the writing process firmed up my belief that boundaries are the foundation of health and happiness well it's amazing um i'm certainly not a medical doctor and, and my disclaimer is i can't ever give uh health advice in that area but we've had over the years four or five clients that have had stage four cancer and then they decided to write a book to leave behind as a gift and in the process of writing that book um, they all ended up beating cancer. And some people have described it as the, you know, their bodies releasing cortisol. Do you have any idea as a health expert, why writing and publishing a book, why journaling, why getting your thoughts down on paper can be such a healing process for so many people? I mean, because yeah. it sounds like, you know, your depression was healed by it too. So I, I don't understand the physiology behind it. Maybe you can shed light to that. Well, Yes, um, <laughs> it, it's pretty deep. When we have these unhealthy thinking patterns and unresolved emotional issues, they do um, create, uh, oh, they bind our energy physically. There's proof that every thought we have releases a neurotransmitter that travels throughout the body. So our bodies hear everything we think. And we say thoughts don't matter, thoughts absolutely matter. And so when we have these negative thinking patterns and they, they and we keep them inside, they take on their own negative loop and they get stronger and more powerful over time. So by writing even, or speaking and releasing um, some of those thoughts and emotions, then it gets, it leaves the body and that leaves the body more room to heal itself our bodies are wise and super smart we just don't pay attention most of the time but when we uh, release and let go of some of this stuff the body has a better um, opportunity to heal itself that's how i see it and that's what i've seen in some clients when they journal like they do the mind dump at bedtime um make that the last thing you do if you have excessive worry or an over overthinker mind dump as the last thing you do before you turn off the light to go to sleep and that will help empty your mind so your mind and your body can rest overnight so for me thoughts do matter thoughts are concrete and they do manifest in reality so release them through writing through speaking through journaling so in essence, when you let go of all that self-talk, all that chatter, all those self-limiting beliefs, and you put them into paper, then your mind can be still and your body can heal more apple. I love that. I'm going to share a quote from Danny Chu, a friend of mine who's ridden his bike across the United States uh, multiple times, and he's a two-time race across America champion. And this is what he said, and I think this is what you're getting at. He said that when you are doing something that you are truly passionate about, you produce a seemingly 
endless flow of energy from within your heart that gives you the ability to accomplish anything that you desire. And I think that's what you've described. You went from being a, a, a grieving, depressed person from you know, the loss of your brother to this amazing, like, I had no idea that you were struggling with depression and you've just blossomed and bloomed into this, you know, award-winning author, uh, this incredible podcaster. We're going to talk more about your podcast later on. But one thing that I found to be ex extremely um, thought-provoking was this concept. When you say your book isn't a how-to, but a why-to. So what does that mean? It's not a how-to, it's a why-to. I'm fascinated by that. <laughs> well, we in, in society these days, we just want to know how to do something. You can Google it. You can Google how to lose weight. You can Google how to exercise properly. You can Google anything these days. It's not the information that matters. Information, knowledge is potential. It's the intent, the why, that's the power. That's where the power comes from. So even if I Google how to lose weight and get the how-tos, that doesn't define my why, that doesn't tell me what my motivation is for doing it that way. So there are no meal plans. There are no regim uh, exercise regimens in living in total health because again, total health is way more than just diet and exercise. It's about all the other intangibles um, in our world, in our lives that complete the picture, the picture of health. So I don't, I don't wanna tell you how to do something. When you open up to why you're doing it, you define your intention and you listen to your intuition, the how shows up. It's why first. Well, and it kind of, I think Simon Sinek and others have talked about when you identify your why, then that gives you that burning drive, that internal desire. Once your why is big enough, the how always appears. And so I love that not looking for a how to, but a why to. And I've never heard that before. Well, let me give you an example. I had a client recently, we, we were talking about boundaries and she said, well, how do you set boundaries? I said, well, why do you want to? She had no response for me. She had no response. So if she doesn't understand why she needs to set boundaries, then she won't, even if she knows how to. So the why first. So the boundaries give you the peace of mind, give you control of your life. Uh, keep people from taking advantage of you. And these are your whys. So yes. do that. So the why can provide that peace. Yes. So when you encounter challenges, what type of therapy do you use? You know, who do you call? How do you, what, what, what kind of therapy do you just uh, subscribe to or prescribe? Um, I primarily use um, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I will use that on myself when I find myself being um, em emotional uh, or having uh, these ruminating, anxious thoughts. I will do cognitive behavioral therapy on myself to narrow down what is going on and then take it from there. I also will reach out to... So before um, you go any further, in layman terms, what is that? Describe cognitive <laughs> behavioral therapy <laughs> for the rest of us. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy basically says that what we think, which is formed, our thinking patterns are formed from our beliefs. So those thinking patterns trigger our emotional experiences. And if we're living on autopilot, which most people are, and by autopilot, I, autopilot, I mean, have you ever driven anywhere and not remembered how you got there? You were on autopilot. So living on autopilot, you have a thought, you have an emotional response that triggers an emotional response. That emotional response on autopilot leads to automatic choices and behaviors, which lead to automatic outcomes. So cognitive behavioral therapy changed the thought, change your outcome, basically. Mm. Wow. Love it. I love it. I love it. So how do you turn off your inner counselor when you're talking to a friend or family member? Because there's got to be a part of you that wants to <laughs> heal everybody, fix everybody, you know, your tennis partner, whomever you're beating in tennis. How do you not, uh, how do you not go there with them? Um, that is a good question. Um, number one, I am really good at compartmentalizing. 
I'm I'm just a really good compartmentalizer. As I was, um, you know, I was a were a uh, I had a a massage therapy practice during the time I was depressed. And so when my book came out, a friend read the book and said, you know what, you're a really good actress because I had no idea you were depressed. Well, my depression didn't belong in the massage in my office. So I didn't show it there. And you, you have to have really good boundaries. Um, it's not my role to counsel or coach uh, family members and friends and people in social situations, unless they specifically ask me for advice about something. It's not, that's a, and that's a boundary issue. It's an emotional boundary. That's not my role in that situation. So I can pull that part of me aside and just be present with them in other ways. Yeah, because if we're all giving advice left and right to just anybody off the street or friends or family, they're going to be like, wait a minute. My life <laughs> yeah. not up. You know? I won't have any social events to go to. <laughs> my boys are now 32 and 28. And I just uh, my younger son and his wife just had a baby. And there's so many things I want to share with them about parenthood, about, you know, this, about that. And I find myself, nope, I got to zip my lips yeah. up. This is not my child. There is nothing I can do except just be happy and you know, except the whole way of, of, of the, how they raise their child. And yes. I got to remember that. So oh, congratulations on that. Yeah. I see a lot of grandparents where they literally manipulate and push and shove their ideals on their children and their parenting. And then the children um, remove grandma and grandpa out of the equation. Yes. And then there's that disconnect because they're trying to parent and that's yes. not the grandparents thing. So I, I like what you said. Don't give advice unless someone asks for it. Yes. Who has inspired you on your career path? Have you had mentors or coaches in your early days? You know, even tennis professionals that you looked up to, uh, people that you admired. How did you uh, kind of uh, who, who did you kind of follow over the years? Over the years, the people who stand out for me. Um, and again, going back to childhood, I was a watcher. I watched interactions and dynamics. I paid close attention to my mother. Uh, single parent, ten kids. She managed and she had difficulties. Um, she had incredible pressures on her. She managed and we all came out of that healthy. Uh, we came out of that alive. We came out of that um, being um, productive adults. So she is my number one role model. Another role model is her sister um, on Ida who was this fiercely independent woman. Um, she didn't have kids of her own, so she kind of took us on and mentored us as well. And so she was just this powerful, loving creature. And so those are my two go-to role models. Others along the way include the late, great Tina Turner. Mm. Um, I remember hearing her story as I was growing up and um, just to break out at 40 and start over at 40 and and just blow up like she did that told me that I can do anything I want to if I put my mind and my energy behind it and so she is a great role model for me and she also demonstrated for me how not to take any mess from anybody <laughs> so are you saying that I didn't know her full story that she wasn't a musician prior to 40 she wasn't a singer prior to that or no, wasn't no, no. she was she was it's just when she and Ike broke up Okay. No one wanted to hear what she had to sing or perform. So she, I think she then went over to Europe and she started over. Mm. She had to start from scratch, basically. So that is and that was so inspiring to me that it's never too late to do what your heart desires. Well, one of my favorite quotes is a setback is a setup for a comeback. <laughs> so I love anybody. A setback is a setup for a comeback. Yes. Great so goal. do you have to self-assess or recharge mentally to prevent burnout in your work as a coach, as a counselor? How do you do that? Uh, I absolutely have to do that. I self-evaluate on a regular basis to see if I'm a, being effective with clients, to see if I could take a different approach with clients. And I also have to clear my energy before each session. So I know some some clients, some therapists and coaches who take clients back to back. I don't. I have to have time in between so I can clear my energy and be as present with that person as I possibly can. And what really, what I need, the bottom line of what I need to uh, recharge 
is I'm naturally an introvert. So I need quiet time. I need downtime. I need yeah. time alone so I can recharge. Well, as an empath, I don't think people that are not as, uh, have as strong empathic abilities, I don't think they realize how challenging it is for us. I once dated a, a psychologist and she would come home from work and oh my goodness, I just felt so much pain on her every day. And she literally had to take a shower just to kind of get rid of that energy from the day. And it is powerful. So I know what you're talking about, that downtime and, uh, and you know, clearing yourself that way. So you are a social worker, a professional speaker, a podcaster, an author, a tennis professional, um, all of these amazing things. What are some of your favorite activities? Is it writing, research, coaching, massage therapy? What are your, some of your most passionate things that you do with your career and your life? At this moment, um, you know, things have, things have shifted for me over the last few years. Um, I'm married six months ago. Um, happy Congratulations. Myself. Thank you. And so I, even before my husband and I started dating, I started shifting uh, what I, how I allocated my time. So um, massage is, was wonderful for me. It was very meditative for me. Yet yeah, that's um, been not high on the priority list over the last few years. I love to write. I've always loved to write. I, I believe I'm more expressive, believe it or not, on paper than I am verbally. And um, I love coaching and doing therapy with clients because of that, the gratification I get from when they get it and when they start to treat themselves well and with love and with honor and make choices that benefit them and those around them. So my favorite activity um, activities are writing, yes, and the coaching slash therapy. Our guest today is Glenn Alex. Her book is titled Living in Total Health, Connecting with Your Wealth, W-E-L-L-T-H. For more information, you go to glennalex.com. And talking about writing, uh, sounds like you got a second book in mind. Uh, can you give us an idea as to what that book m might look like? Um, yes, I am working on my second book with you, Patrick. Thank you very much. And by the way, I highly recommend Patrick as a writing coach. He is very motivating, very inspiring, and he's full of useful functional information. I love that. Um, so yes, book number two will be more about boundaries. It'll actually be all about boundaries. Um, boundary is a critical part of health and well-being. And so I, I want to pull it out of living in total health and expand on it because the, we have so much, they're just poor boundaries in our world that are front and center. And what inspired me to do just the book on, on boundaries was all of the drama in, uh, from the pandemic, people not friends anymore because they disagreed on this and on that and telling other, each other what to do and how to do it, boundary issues for me. So book number two will be focused on healthy boundaries. So how do we set healthy boundaries? What's the best advice you can give us for all of those other people in our life that are trying to take advantage of us, trying to borrow money from us, trying to do this and do that? How do we go about setting boundaries to protect ourselves? Well, my first response to that is, why would you set boundaries? <laughs> why do you want to set those boundaries? Number two, the how-to is, is not, it's not as simple, it's not as simple as society says it is. It's not about saying no. Sometimes healthy boundaries are about not putting yourself in a position to have to say yes or no. So it's the work before you get to that point. And um, boundaries are contextual, boundaries are flexible depending on who, what, when, where, and how long. So there's no simple answer to how to set them. OK, if you press me to give you one answer, I will say I, I will do that. I'll press you to give you one. answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in setting boundaries, you must be clear. About the choice you're making, the yes or the no, you must be clear about the potential consequences from the yes or from the no and accept the one consequence that you're willing to live with. You mm. can't say, yes, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, and then complain about, I've got too much to do. 
Yeah. Wow. Okay. People often think about setting boundaries and the importance of setting boundaries so they don't take on everybody else's drama, so they don't get taken advantage of, so they don't lend all their money away. But talk about the importance of you talked about making good choices in in you know early on that moderation is key. So talk about the importance of setting boundaries for ourselves, like maybe only one drink or one dessert, or you know I'm only going to stay out until eleven o'clock, or I'm not going to pull an all nighter like I did when I was a kid. You know, talk about the importance of setting boundaries for ourselves, not just for other people. Okay, well you're talking about what some people call inner boundaries. I call that self discipline. Mm. it's again it's your why why do you need to be in bed by 11 o'clock why do you need to not eat so much junk food the why is because i want to maintain my weight or i want to be as fit as i can or i want to be as refreshed and as mentally clear as i can sleep is required for that eating healthier foods or eating fewer unhealthy foods is is required if you want to maintain a certain weight or or um, level of fitness. So it's the why. It's the why. Your discipline depends on your why. So in essence, uh, it's late at night. Your spouse has gone to bed. You're on the computer watching goofy Tic Tac videos. <laughs> you know, one video after another, it's all of a sudden 930. And then you get on this rampite and you just keep watching these videos. And then you get to watch some of those crazy cat videos. And then you're looking at your politic videos and then you're doing this and it's 11 o'clock and then you keep going and keep going. And then, but yeah, at some point you have to think, wait a minute, I have to get up in the morning. I want to feel good tomorrow. And in order for me to feel good tomorrow, I need to get to bed by 10 30, 11 o'clock. Yes. I can't stay up till one o'clock watching these goofy videos. Yes. And that's kind of what you're saying is think about your why your yes. why is so that you feel better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that way I'm going to go to bed at a reasonable time tonight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're unwilling to make the choice to go to bed, then that brings up another issue. What are you distracting yourself from? Yeah. What deep rooted pain do you have when you peel those layers of the onion back that's causing you to have to be entertained by TikTok or whatever else? Yes. I like Very the way you, say, you said TikTok. <laughs> TikTok, yeah. So do you find as much success as a coach as a therapist with your online sessions compared to in-person? What's the difference? What do you prefer? Is one more successful than another? I actually prefer online. Um, you, once you handle the, the security measures required for online work, then clients actually tend to be more open, more engaged. When we say online, online. you're talking Zoom, not on the phone, but Zoom, correct? Uh, some phone uh, on the phone. Uh, okay. Some people don't want to be seen, though I prefer to see them. But yes, via Zoom or some other visual platform, um, clients tend to be more comfortable online because being online strips away, you know, appearance. How how are they going to think of the way I'm dressed or my shoes or, you know, sitting across the room or whatever that dynamic is removed. So, so people can actually... Um, it's more fa and it's face to face. Yeah, it's, it's more personal. So do I, you I find, prefer online. Do you do you find that when you're in person with somebody sitting across from them, you pick up more of their energy as an empath uh, versus when you're on a computer, you don't pick up as much of their energy, or is it the same either way? Um, you can pick up more physical energy in person, yet if if you're paying attention, then you can tell when. You can see someone's expression, their pain expression or their joy. You can see their posture. You can see their, uh, you know, uh, genuflections or whatever. So I, I think it's comparable. Um, it might be a little different than in person, but it's still effective. Very good. Very good. Well, last question about health and wellness. And then I want to talk a little bit about tennis and then how can people <laughs> get a copy of the book and, and do you do a complimentary session, all of that. So just real quickly, what's the best overall health advice that you can give to all of us? What are two or three things that all of us need to implement into our lives so that we can, uh, you know, uh, better connect with our wealth so that we can have our health and our wealth together? Two or three or four bits of advice that you think that 
everybody needs to walk away from this interview knowing? Number one, listen to yourself. Mm. Again, your body is wise and your intuition is there to guide you. By listening to yourself, you get a deeper understanding of what you need and how to get your needs met. If you don't listen to yourself and again, externalize your power to what she said you should do, what he said you should do, then you are really leaving your health up to chance. And what works for one person will not necessarily work for you. Mm. An example is I have food allergies. So, so many of these healthy foods are harmful to me. And if people, when I've had people say, well, this won't hurt you. I'm like, yeah, I will. <laughs> so I'm not eating it. Okay. Yeah. Which brings us back to a boundary issue. So listen to yourself and do your research. See what resonates with you. If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, do something else. Listening to self is critical. The other piece I would say is to advocate for yourself. Once you've listened to yourself and you're in front of the doctor and the doctor says, take this medicine. No, I'm allergic to penicillin or sulfur or whatever it is. The doctor says, no, this is the best medicine for you. Take it, it won't hurt you. You must advocate for yourself and say, no, I'm not taking that. What's another medication? It's my belief, my perspective that 90, 95% of patients will do what they're told, whether it's good for them or not, because they said it, the expert said this was the way to go. That's not always right. Because they're missing number one. They're not listening to themselves. They're not listening, listening to, to somebody themselves. else. And they're not advocating for themselves. No, this doesn't work for me. I need to, can, can you recommend something else? Yeah, very good. Excellent. And then as a result of that, you know, live in balance. And I, I like you said, moderation is key. Maybe that would be your number three. You know, <laughs> do everything in moderation. I love that. So obviously you do things in moderation because you're an author, speaker, and coach. Let's talk about your podcast real quick. Uh, what is the, um, you know, the Glenn Alex podcast show? Uh, talk all about what is that all about? And well, how can people learn more and where do they go to listen to that? Okay. Um, the Glenn Alex show um, is now in its sixth year. And um, it's once a month, twice a month, uh, just whatever works out. And every episode of the Glenn Alex show focuses on a different aspect of health. So I've had professionals and people with health stories on talking about physical health, weight loss, nutrition, massage therapy, um, mental health, uh, anxiety, depression, emotions, relationships, boundaries. So we cover the whole gamut. And each episode, again, focuses on a different aspect of health. My last guest was uh, about clarity, being clear about your goals for health and wellness and for mental health. And um, I'm proud to say that every single episode has a unique guest. There's been, there have been no repeat guests on the Glenn Alex show in six years. So I'm really proud of that. Um, you can uh, tune into the episodes on my website, glennalex.com slash the Glenn Alex show, or you can go to my YouTube channel, Living in Total Health. And, and see the episodes there. Um, you, if you subscribe to either YouTube or the website, then you'll be notified when the new episodes are published. And also we need to have you uh, promote that show on the author publishers group on Facebook. Okay. 3000 members there that would love to learn more and, and hear more. Oh, great. I can do that. Yeah. So let's kind of transition about your tennis career. <laughs> My first question is tennis or pickleball? Which is better? Because <laughs> it seems like pickleball is going crazy. And maybe pickleball is for lazy people and tennis is for the true athlete. I mean, what, <laughs> talk about that. Not for lazy people by any stretch. Um, tennis is the love. Of, well, tennis was the love of my life before I married. Um, tennis is number two. Unfortunately, I'm in an area now where tennis isn't as prominent as it was in Vegas. So I am learning pickleball. And um, a lot of tennis players, recreational tennis players who have knee injuries, uh, knee issues, issues with their backs or shoulders can no longer play tennis or cover the whole court. They have turned to pickleball, which is easier on the body. And so my husband and I have had two lessons so far and we can bring our athleticism to pickleball. And it, it's kind of exciting to see how we can do that. Um, it, it, I say tennis if you can do it 
And if it's available to you, pickleball is a, is a good second best. So maybe tennis up until 65 or 70, and then from 70 to 110, you know, choose pickleball or something along. <laughs> well, it depends on the physicality. I know some 70 year olds who still play tennis singles. Wow. They can cover the court effectively. So it depends on your physical condition Yeah. as well. No, I have a, my daughter-in-law is a professional tennis player. She came wow. over from Bali to play and she was played in the junior Wimbledon, Wimbledon and, um, I just was blown away. I took her out on the court. She had like flip flops on. And I was trying to go line to line to line. And she was just pounding, just pounding the ball. And I could just barely get around on either side. So I, I definitely saw the difference between, you know, tennis as a pro and an amateur. Yes. But when I would play back in the day, it was always serve and volley, serve and volley, and serve and get to the net and serve and get to the net. And she was saying that that's not as used or a strategy as often now as it once was. What's your no, take on that? serve and volley and why is it not as unpopular is it because it's physically too demanding i don't know no i don't think that's why i think um it, it became more players staying back especially in doubles is because they're more powerful they can just yeah. drive the ball and get it deeper on the other side of the court without having to be at the net yeah so I, don't, I don't think it's laziness it's just you know they have a different skill set yeah more power very good yeah wow well how can people get in touch with you if they want to book you for a speaking engagement or do you offer a complimentary health and wellness consultation and how can they get a hold of you to schedule that? Well, I can be contacted um, at Glenn, G-L-E-N at glennalex.com. And you can book me for a speaking engagement, um, reach out to me for that. And yes, I do offer a complimentary consultation. You can also message me for that and we can set it up. Uh, it's a 30 minute complimentary consultation. I will offer a summer special coming up starting June 1st. If you purchase Living in Total Health, the hardcover from my Amazon distributor, then uh, you have complimentary access to my um, Healthy Boundaries for Overwhelmed Women's online course. So that's coming up June 1st. So to get a copy of your book, uh, first off, your email again, glenn at glennalex.com. Yes. Glenn at glennalex.com to book you for a speaking or for to schedule your complimentary consultation. Where's the best place that people can pick up and purchase a copy of your book, Living in Total Health? Uh, the best place is my website, glennalex.com. I offer um, hardcover, offer ebook, and offer paperback. Very good. Yeah. And if they buy off your site, you might sign the book. Is that right? Or yeah, if they buy from my site, I will sign the book before it ships. Very good. Excellent. Okay, this show is called the Patrick and Mary Unstoppable Author Interview Series. And Mary's middle name, we call her M-U-W, Mary Unstoppable West. And she was the driving <laughs> force behind starting this, uh, this series. And so based on that, I want to ask Glenn Alex, how do you define the word unstoppable? I see unstoppable as living your personal truth and sharing it with others. Um, we all have innate gifts and talents that I think the rest of the world needs to be privy to. And if we all lived in our personal truth, I promise you the world would be a much, much better place because it, our personal truth is based on authentic love and joy. And while we may run into obstacles and challenges our personal truth could be paused. Um, it could be delayed. I don't believe it can be stopped. So whatever you're facing, whatever your circumstance, please don't shrink from who you are. Be unstoppable and be yourself no matter what, because you can make the world such a, a, a much better place by being who you are and living into your authenticity. So that's what unstoppable is for me, no matter what. And, you know, me, I'm raised working poor by a single mother of 10. I've accomplished a lot in my life. There are people who have come from worse circumstances who are doing far greater things than I am. Be unstoppable. Do what you know resonates with you. Follow your calling and don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Very good. And I love your bits of advice. Listen to yourself advocate for yourself and all things in moderation. Yeah. Three brilliant nuggets of wisdom. Well, Glenn, thank you so much. You guys go to glennalex.com, pick up a copy of her book, book her as a speaker. 
uh, hire her as a coach. We're so thrilled. Thank you so very much. Can you stick around for a few minutes for Q&A? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Let's give her a big hug. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you again for tuning in to The Glenn Alex Show. Please like, subscribe, and share.